Hi, thanks for tuning in. My name is Eric Orchard and I'm here today to introduce you to the video you're about to see. I'm one of the 26 members of the WPPA that are trying to create a structural shift in how pilots at WestJet are represented. We hope you find the video informative and provides you with information about what the WPPA is all about. The video you're about to see was recorded on the 10th of January in Calgary. It was our first public meeting. To date, the movement has been very grassroots. We've been meeting with individuals on personal levels or hosting coffee houses. We've been finding the response to our message overwhelmingly positive. And in an attempt to reach out to the people that aren't able to attend one of our events, we created this video for you to view at your leisure. About the video you're about to see, Captain Ian Green, Captain Rob McFadden, and Captain Steve Weir do the primary presenting. The video starts off with an introduction from Ian Green. He basically goes through the five W's of the who, what, where, when, and why of our organization and its entire structure. That will be followed by an introduction by Captain Rob McFadden, many of you know him as Seabass. They handle a frequently asked questions section and then we turned the meeting over to the audience which we fielded approximately 21 questions. To make this video as user friendly as possible, we created a table of contents. So the introductions followed by the questions should be all on text format below this video right now with a time sequence beside it so that you can scroll through the video at your leisure. That's about all I have for you now folks. Thank you very much for your attention. We hope you find this video informative and in understanding what we're really all about here. Very importantly, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or you wish to get involved, probably the best place I can direct you is our website, wppa.ca. All of our contact information is on there and also a link to our public forum. Enjoy and thanks again for your time. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming here. It's uh, really glad to see a turnout like this. Uh, whether you agree or disagree or you're just uh, seeking information on this, this is all part of the process here. We're in it for... Uh, as long as it takes to get the message out. So as an introduction, who are these WPPA guys? So we hear that. Uh, I know a lot of you in the room already, so that's pretty good. You don't have to uh, ask that as much, but uh, it stems back from, for some of us, it stems back from a little while ago, but we've recognized a need for uh, an evolution in the way that we uh, conduct our representation here at WestJet. Uh, we're not a bunch of uh, radicals or militants, in fact, uh, there's quite a few of us that have a history of working uh, within the WJPA or with certain aspects within the office that are on the uh, executive and committee list. Um, to, uh, we're not out to destroy the company by any means, and I can speak uh, on behalf of, uh, of the uh, WPPA members when we say we all realize that no one at WestJet has more to lose uh, if the company as a corporation doesn't thrive. Right? We're the first in line to take the uh, pay cuts when it does happen, and we're the most invested career-wise too, So, uh, just so that's clear going forward. What are we trying to do? Quite clearly, we're trying to evolve the uh, representation model here at WestJet. Uh, through discussions and through trying within the system, as many of us have, is we've uh, determined that the best way is to uh, go down the certification road. Why? Well, the reason is, if, unless you've had your head buried in the sand for uh, the last little while, you've probably realized that we've been presented with some challenges uh, through the way that uh, perhaps the Encore language was uh, presented to us or the rollout and administration of the uh, tentative agreement. And uh, these aren't the fault of the guys that are in there or doing that job by any means, and it's not the fault of the company. We look at it as it's just uh, systemic in the breakdown or the failure to evolve of how our, our system represents us as pilots. Why now? Well, that's an interesting question. So, I, as some of the guys in the room can attest to here, and even from past experiences, the process to go through and certify pilot representation isn't an overnight thing. It takes a little bit of work, and to do it properly, it takes a lot of planning and preparation. So. The time not to do that is when uh, you're in a merger or you're in a bankruptcy or you're in the, there's a war in the Middle East that's challenging your operations at home. The time to do that is now. It's when we're making money, when we're doing all right, when morale is good and we've got a good engaged employee group. How are we going to do it? Well, hopefully in the next uh, few slides there is we'll outline the process of how we start to go about and talk about doing that. But the big part about how we're going to do it is starting right here through meetings like this, in the room, talking, answering your questions and presenting you why we think this is the thing to do. 
If you haven't seen the Constitution yet, it is available on uh, WPPA.ca. I encourage you, I know it's for most pilots, it's pretty boring and mundane stuff to go through, but it is the actual foundation of how we're gonna conduct business should we get this through. Uh, it's the mechanism through which each member will be represented, both individually and collectively. Okay. Guarantees control of the association remains completely in the hands of the membership. And it's founded on the principles of dedicated and exclusive representation, financial transparency, and full accountability. So that's the, basically the business model of what the Constitution does. These objectives are just basically cut and paste directly from the Constitution, but they're important ones that I thought, and I'll read through them generally quick and maybe highlight a few ones, but they're important to see how the um, Constitution enables the representation to be accountable to the membership. So the sole mandate is to operate as a non-profit association solely representing the pilot employees of WestJet Airlines. So it's a non-profit association. All funds, all benefits are for the pilots only. It's not going to any outside source or any outside franchise union. Objective is to protect the individual and collective rights of the members of the association and to promote their professional interests. I don't need to highlight on that. To establish and exercise the right of collective bargaining for the purpose of negotiating, maintaining employment agreements for the members of the association. So it's not, it's just a small piece of what a, a proper pilot association does but it is about ratifying and enforcing collective agreements, right? Or our pilot agreement. Uh, that's a long one, but it's uh, to preserve and increase the WestJet pilot jobs by ensuring all flying done by WestJet regional affiliates, code shares, joint ventures, and other flying done under the WestJet brand does not threaten or hinder the career progression of working conditions of the pilots at WestJet. So this doesn't mean that we can't enter into wet lease agreements or that we wouldn't as long as we can uh, establish a clear mandate that they're not going to harm or interfere with the regular career progression of the pilots. And uh, having language in this, it does put the onus on us as a pilot association to make sure if, the, if there is a way that that flying can be allocated to the pilots at WestJet or regional pilots, for instance, can be brought under our umbrella and increase our numbers, then by all means we should do that, right? to establish a relationship with other employee groups at the company to share information and support where mutual benefit is possible. So this is a big one, especially for anyone that has concerns about thinking that this is gonna to, uh, devalue our relationship with the other employee groups at WestJet. That's not, it's in our constitution. And there's a lot of issues that we're, we're globally connected with other employees where it makes a lot of sense as us, uh, for us as a pilot association or as a pilot group to interact with the other employees. You know, and that's basically the spirit in which PACT was, uh, was initially arrived at. We have a few guys in the room that can attest to that. Um, the, one of the differences we don't answer to PACT necessarily when it comes to representing our own interests as pilots, right? And we can also offer ourselves as a resource in the future to the other employee groups in, this, in the uh, pure WestJet fashion to establish a relationship with any organization or other pilot associations to share information and support where mutual benefit is possible. This is a big one that I think uh, the reason for having the independent pilot association and it's where we, we could have done more you know, for the last 17 years than we have and that's getting out into the industry, getting out and uh, going to other pilot associations, sharing our resources, discussing training and standards and I'll allude to that a little bit more uh, in a later slide about the advantages of having our own independent resources and being able to interact with the other pod associations in the world. It's a big one to promptly settle disputes and grievances which may arise between the members and the company. It doesn't matter how great the corporate culture is or, or how great the corporation or the company is or how great the pilot group is, but there will always be conflicts that can use dispute resolution. And having a clearly defined process in place to do that is what's fair to both the company and to the pilot group. And here's another one where uh, we could do a little bit more in my belief is to promote safety leadership and professional image through training, communication and community involvement. So this is another one as a company, as a corporation, WestJet does a good job in getting out to the community and uh, attaching their name and resources to certain charities. But as pilots, we also have an interest in doing that on our own in the interest of our profession and as our pilot group as a whole.
going through the Constitution, it would uh, later go on to have a whole bunch of language on what the uh, role of the executive is and how they're elected and, and the, the certain things. But this is one of those cases where uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, in my opinion. So uh, up here is, uh, is a temporary organization chart. And uh, like I said, it's interim. So all, none of these are in stone. This is the names that you see here are basically just placeholders. But to speak to the organization chart itself, I draw your attention to membership being at the top. So that's what this is all about is the, the um, pilot association, the WPPA is accountable fully to the membership. They guide whatever happens in the pilot association through, through uh, their motions and their initiatives and who they elect to put in the spots. What we have underneath that is an accountability and oversight committee. Uh, it's got a to be announced there. That is, although it doesn't have a specific place in our constitution, that is a way that we see as a transition from, from our current process of representing ourselves as pilots to the WPPA. These are guys that could be uh, day one founders, they could be guys that have worked in ex-management roles or work in management roles. Uh, they're left blank for a couple reasons, as we probably don't want them kicked off the forum yet, uh, for one. And uh, the other one is, is that, that it's, it may not be our um, position as the interim executive until the elections are done to pick who those spots are. There's probably some company feedback on who should be in that spot, but that's kind of an accountability and oversight between the membership to ensure that in the short term that the, the general view of the membership is being responded to and pervaded accurately by the uh, executive. Uh, all the uh, positions in the executive are elected as a position, so you have to go through an election process. So like I said, these are just here temporarily, placeholders. I was actually a little bit later to the party than some of these guys, but uh, as, uh, as time has went on, we've stepped up. Traditionally, how it works is that the executive would then choose the committee members by a two-thirds majority. And uh, these committees are all just an example of what could be. So for us to say that there will necessarily be a... Uh, a hotel committee in the new one. Maybe, maybe the uh, elected executive will be happy with how uh, the hotels are currently handled. But these are examples of what can be done for, uh, and the level of engagement that we'd achieve by having an independent pod association. And I think an important aspect of this is to understand is that all the positions within the committee and within this will be chosen fully by the membership. So the company always uh, we will welcome their input and stuff, but the fact is that when you take it into your own umbrella and take responsibility for your representation, then it's chosen by the pilots purely. An important part of uh, the accountability piece of, uh, of the Constitution and of, uh, of a viable uh, pilot association is the ability to recall officers and, and to have elections. So as it sits right now, the, the top four names on the uh, executive list, the president, vice president, treasurer and secretary, may be recalled at any time by a two-thirds vote of the base rep. So you saw the six base reps there, four of them get together and they don't agree with, with how the executive is doing the day-to-day -day business, they can recall them. Uh, from, directly from the membership, a petition started of one-third of any base membership will trigger a two-third vote of the entire membership to recall any officer. So if there's one guy that misrepresented his views and the way he's going to conduct himself within the association, and the membership takes offense to that, as they can, within any base, they could conduct a uh, petition. Once they get a third of that base, th it'll go to a vote of the entire membership and they can recall that person. So, uh, within the base, within each base, there's similar language to uh, remove a base rep as well. So it's basically the one third petition and then a two third vote of the base. While this is happening, what we do have is an, uh, a very strong languaged election policy. So the reason of having all those committees and stuff is that you, you designate a lot of the day-to-day -day duties of the association and the interaction between the company off to, at the committee level. What that, that, what that enables then is you're uh, able to carry on elections annually for basically about half of the members. So how it's set up in the Constitution is that every year, there's an opportunity for half of the members to be re-elected. The reason it's only half is so that there's a little bit of consistency within the executive, but basically within uh, less than a two year period, you can reshuffle that entire executive if they're not serving your purposes. At the committee level, the work there going on that's interacting with the company and at various departments can continue to go. It's only directed by the executive. So the committee level just keeps going on. And if, if there's a change in the executive that's driven through the pilots, 
then and they want something changed about the committee work, then the executive will under the will advise the committees how they want to change things. So all the committee members are elected by a two thirds majority of the executive. So you, Pilots elect the executive. Executives have to agree by two-thirds on each of the committee members. There's nothing saying that you can't have a vote for the committee members. Uh, if it's an important one or we get a sense or the executive gets a sense that they want the pilots to choose, then they will. It'll be done by the, uh, there'll be an election for the committee. Uh, like I said, that's the whole, that's all I'm going to give you and, and uh, subject you to on the Constitution. But if you haven't or if you would, please take the time to go uh, look at it. Uh, it's on the website at WPP. A.ca. We move on now to the uh, Canada Labor Code. And there's two slides that are a little bit long, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to just summarize them for you. Uh, but as most of you know, WestJet is already legally required to comply with the Canada Labor Code because it's a federally regulated industry. So we already do comply with a few. I, I think I recognize a guy or two that's been on an OSH committee here. Occupational Health and Safety Part 2, that's the uh, piece of the Labor Code that you see on every bulletin board and every crew room and stuff, is because we're legally required to follow that part of the la Labor Code. Part 3, Standard Hours, Wages, Vacations and Holidays. Uh, throughout WestJet we've created uh, um, basically policies on how we uh, pay our people and how we conduct our business. So if you go through Westnet, we have all these policies. But under the Labor Code, there's certain minimums that are guaranteed, and that's where a lot of that is driven from. So that, uh, a lot of those are maternity, parental, bereavement, leave. That all comes from Part 3 of the uh, Labor Code. There's only three parts. Part 1, Industrial Relations, is the part that we don't subscribe to right now. So that's what gives us access to... Uh, conflict resolution, mediation if required, arbitration, uh, basically anything where we can invoke the Canadian Industrial Relations Board to come in and help us settle any of our issues or to help us with the day-to-day -day running of the business. The only way to uh, take part in the first part of the Canada Labour Code requires us to be legally certified. So that's when you talk about becoming certified, signing a card, that's what that means. And it's, it is involved in establishing the agency of authority of who's going to represent. So right now at WestJet, we've, years ago they agreed that, uh, that we will be represented through PACT, but it wasn't done through an agency of authority. It's just how people sitting around decided that they would do business. So Certification, I know that's the, so unionizing, that's the word that uh, everyone seems scared of here. And I, I want you to uh, bear with me here as I read uh, just a piece out of the very first part of the preamble of the Canada Labour Code, and uh, you'll have to bear with me, but it says, and whereas the Parliament of Canada desires to continue and extend its support to labour and management in their cooperative efforts to develop good relations and constructive collective bargaining practices, and deems the development of good industrial relations to be in the best interests of Canada in ensuring a just share of the fruits of progress to all. So it doesn't say anywhere that uh, unions are out to destroy business or, <laughs> or to become unfair and uh, wreck employee re employer relationships. This is, an, as a little background if you're interested, is that, uh, the current version of the Labour Code was uh, ratified in 1985 under a strong conservative, uh, conservative majority government under Brian Mulroney. So it's not, it was put in place, it's the... The people that, that work at the Labour Board are a combination of people from ex-Labour backgrounds and ex-business backgrounds that are put into those positions to work for the Board. And that's, this is their sole policy. It's to, it's to ensure a balance between the collective rights of employees and the corporation so that, they're, that they can negotiate and work through issues together. Just a few tidbits out of the Canada Labour Code, and I won't read through all this, but duty of fair representation, so it makes it... Uh, when, elect, when your um, representative unit is certified under the Canada Labour Code, then the agents or the officers acting on behalf of the employees are legally obligated not to act in a manner that is arbitrary, discriminatory, or in bad faith of the representation. So it means that it's, it becomes the responsibility of the employee representation to make sure that due process, out, as outlined under the Labour Code, is followed. So right now we do it at WestJet, it's the responsibility of the corporation to make sure if it's followed. If it's not, there's no process in there to make sure it is. You know, there's a, there's a PAC process, but it still follows, falls underneath of the uh, corporate process. So there is actually no way for us to say, you didn't do that. We don't think that you referred to this employee at that, and we have no way to get 
third-party resolution on that whatsoever. Uh, merger or sale protection, where an employer sells a business. This is a cut and paste right out of the code. A trade union that is the bargaining agent for the employees employed in the business continues to be their bargaining agent. So right now, we don't have that. If, if the company is sold, there is nothing protecting our current contract language from carrying over to the next business. And that's, that goes, unless your collective agreement has been filed with the Industrial Relations Board, there's absolutely no way to, to enforce that. Requirement in, to enter into collective bargaining. I won't read it all. What it means and one of the threats that I've heard is that, well, if we, if we certify, then the company's just gonna use delaying tactics and we'll never, we'll never get a new agreement. The fact is there's very concise timelines and language within the labor code. Uh, you're welcome to it if you want. But uh, <laughs> within the labor code that sets time periods in which the certain stages of the collective bargaining process must be complied with. So. Uh, you can't delay tactics, it's just a matter of uh, there's time limits set where you can force it to mediation. If that still isn't done, then the board can come in and advocate on behalf of either the employer or the employee to make sure that everyone's bargaining in good faith. And th these people, this is what they do for a living, this is their business, so they can recognize if there's been any, any uh, shady dealings on either side of it as well. So it's, like I said, it's about the preamble, it's about keeping the keeping the machine going and ensuring that good relations exist between the employee and the employer and that it's balanced. Binding contract. Uh, a collective agreement entered into between the bargaining agent and the employer in respect of a bargaining unit uh, is binding on the bargaining agent, every employee in the bargaining unit and the employer. So this doesn't mean uh, that it can never be changed or that you can't work in a collaborative fashion to come up with good language, but what it means is that it cannot be changed without the agreement of both parties. So it's not a change in, in working together. If, if there's a good way to do something, you know, uh, or if, if you're in the middle of a collective agreement and there's a change that can be agreed to by the employees and the employer that's gonna benefit, then by all means you do it. And it's just a matter of kind of the mechanisms that we've put in now, but those are, those are all derived from legal contracts, like an LOU or an MOA, but that's all it is. It's just, it has to be agreed to by both parties. And that's all that means. It doesn't mean that you can't work with the company or you can't collaborate. Section 60 contains uh, language for mediation and arbitration. So mediation, for those of you who are familiar, is the first step where if, if there seems to be a conflict, whether it be just in, uh, in um, the treatment of an individual employment, employee, uh, a misinterpretation or possible misinterpretation of some contract language is that we can uh, request that uh, from the Labour Board that a mediator comes in place, an independent third party with industry knowledge of the business and quite possibly the company before, sometimes mediators are used again, but they come in and they sit and work with the two parties to see if they can mediate an agreement. If, uh, if that doesn't work and, and uh, for some reason you can't come to a mutual, mutually accepted uh, conclusion, then the next step is arbitration. So the, the employer and the employee can agree to an arbitrated settlement. So all they're saying is that we're going to take a similar person like that, uh, the mediator, except this one will be a counselor arbitrating judge, and their decision, they'll, they'll be presented with the case from both sides, and their decision will be binding on both parties. So. It's a, way, it's a way, all of these things are just a way of independent dispute resolution so that both the company and the pilot association or whoever the employee represents can get back to the business of, of, uh, of uh, taking care of their members. Dues, everyone wants to hear about this, I'm sure. So first, uh, under the constitution as it's written, $25 per month for new hires for the first year. It's just a flat rate. It's not calculated as percentage. And there, there's a reason it is done for the first year because even under the labor code and through uh, labor history in Canada and labor law is that that first year probationary period, even for a fully certified all out uh, union, is, it's, uh, that probationary period is up to the discretion of the employer. So it's to see if the person is a good fit in there. You know? As long as they come in and act in good faith though, uh, your job is reasonably be protected. But for that reason, and for the primary reason that uh, our, our first starting wage uh, wages at any airline, you know, are quite low, is that it's set at $25 per month. 1% of base salary. Well, like I said, this, uh, we'll get into a slide a little bit later about the kind of things that, that we're asking us to take responsibility for is in, in employer representation. But the 1%, it's just the base salary rate. 
uh, ESP options, profit share, and other bonuses are not assessed. That 1% is a, is a starter for us, especially as a new association. We'll have some catching up to do on building up, uh, you know, our, building up a staff, building up our resources, building up a legal fund. So the 1% is a base to start, but as a nonprofit association, our goal will always be to drive that down over time, to be, become as efficient and productive as we can. Transfer of costs to the government. I'll talk about this a little bit later too, but when you pay that 1%, it's a tax write-off on line, I want to say 260 of your income tax reform. Uh, it's in the same section as RSP, so it, it comes directly off your taxable income like an RSP does. So in effect, what, we're, what we do right now in our, in our uh, representation model is if we, if we have an expense uh, for, for a pilot association due or a representation due is that it either comes out of the PAC dues or it comes out of the bottom line of the flight ops budget as a line, line item. By taking responsibility for this and putting it under our own umbrella is we are indirectly taking responsibility. It comes off of our check as a 1%, but we take that 1% and we write it off. So for our marginal rates, if you're lucky enough to live in Alberta at 40% or unfortunate to live in the places in the East Coast at 46%, is that we're taking that amount of money and transferring it to the government. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a loophole, but it's designed that way because this is the way that the government of Canada is to, decided that they want employees to represent themselves within, the, within Canada and they've made it a taxable, uh, a tax write-off for that reason. Advantages. So these are some of the advantages and, and by all means we'll listen to your questions about uh, disadvantages afterwards, should you have them, about taking responsibility for our um, representation. Independent budget and staff. As it sits right now, if you want something done in the pilot association, you have to go request that resource from the company and uh, it will get put in the, in the line of priority as opposed to what's going on in the company at that time. Having our own independent budget and resources means that it's the executive and the committee members driven by the membership that get to decide how that money is used. Independent competitive cost studies. If the pilot association leading up to an agreement wanted to conduct a Seabury report or any number of, of uh, businesses that do that is that they can go out into the market as their own business unit with their own resources and request that. By requesting it on their own, then we own, the pilot association would own that data and we can use it however we see fit. Independent surveys. As it sits right now, to get a survey done, we use the corporate resource, which is very nice of them, although we could be transferring part of the cost of that to the government, and we could do it at our own will. So there's a lineup of corporate surveys. They're done all the time within WestJet. So as a pilot association right now, you get in that lineup and you conduct a survey, and your survey questions have to run through a bit of a gamut in order to get the questions approved. Right? They're not questions that are driven 100% by the pilots. Loss of license insurance. This is a tricky one, and this is part of the tax code. And I can give you the I can give you the uh, reference uh, income tax act language that references this. But loss of license insurance is always handled under an independent pilot association. It's for this reason because now to get loss of license insurance, the corporation does not want to take any responsibility for that. It will be contracted to an outside source, which means you bring in a third party to help with the administration and the liability of it. By having our own resources and our own independently, legally recognized, not-for-profit association is that we can reduce that cost a lot because we're basically taking that 1% money or whatever extra money that you put in and we're putting it in to manage the loss of life insurance through an insurance company ourselves but we're eliminating at least one step in there. And it also gives the ability for loss of license insurance and other benefits to extend beyond your employment with the corporation as well. Airline pilot association conferences. So uh, earlier when I alluded to um, reaching out and contacting and, and discussing other pilot associations, I want to give you an example of the stuff that comes from these kind of meetings. So uh, the whole idea of having a pro standards department, pilot health department, these are all conferences that take place on a weekly basis all over the world right now with independent pilot associations from the world. And a lot of the things that we take for granted nowadays have all started at the grassroots level from independent pot associations. And that only happens when they have their own resources. Airlines don't do this. 
they don't, they don't reach out and, and do this. And if you look through the history of aviation, especially in North America, uh, um, weather radar, uh, ACAS and ATC, cockpit design, cockpit security, approach design, nav standards, these all came from pilot association levels. Corporations, the airlines, yeah, they want to run, they want to run uh, companies and they want to run businesses, but the, the guys with their feet on the ground, so to speak, or our, our, uh, our heads in the air, are the ones that developed, and you can research this all, saw the need for the first navigation aids were from pilot associations because they got together collectively as independent units to make the business case for these, for GPWS systems, you could never make the business case for a GPWS system. You know, for hull losses and stuff, on a pure business level, you could, they ha I mean, you could argue to this day that they haven't saved enough money, you know, to warrant themselves. They were only done through, starting at the grassroots level, the pot association brought up and then collectively lobbied for it through government and the proper change, but it takes an independent association to do that. Uh, cosmic radiation studies, we have 17 years in existence, 1,200 pilots, we have no policy for that yet. Uh, crew resource management all came from pilot associations. Fatigue management scheduling software, these conferences take place all the time. And it's a, it's a bunch of pilot associations from all over the world with their real life feet on the ground experiences on what their, on what their flight crews are, are doing and, and access to the AQD reports and stuff that are bringing their intelligence into this. Uh, the business and industry trends one is actually a, a very interesting one because throughout the world, you know, and you've seen it in our own corporation is, uh, is the, uh, the leaders and then they're, they're more than fit to run the business and stuff, but they come in, they'll, they'll have their way with the business for a while and then they'll take what they've garnered and learned onto the next business. There's no debrief for the rest of us that are sitting here, but where it does happen is that the business industry and trends is also monitored from the pilot side because just like us, other pilots at other companies have, have a lot to lose should their particular business fail. Everyone knows there's nothing more expensive than starting at the bottom of another seniority list in your career. So these guys have taken a real interest in this and this is where the pilots with their feet on the ground, we can get together and start measuring industry trends you know, and having a positive effect. And if there's a good way to do something, we can take that back to our own company too and say, you know what, this is what's happening in, in England right now. You know, we can bring that back. Uh, yeah, like I said, so uh, fatigue management, scheduling software, I've been, to, I've been fortunate to be to these conferences where it is a bunch of pod associations and their scheduling reps and stuff going through, speaking with the software designers on how, to, how we can organize these duty days and these pairing generation software to be uh, a little bit easier on the pilots. Anyways, I'll, I'll leave that one. Corporate security, uh, the ramp pass that we have in Canada was, a, was actually a, uh, a pod association initiative. And when you think of it, the, the cost of us waiting in line with all the rest of the other uh, passengers or guests is a zero cost to the company, right? But until a pilot association goes out and starts advocating on that behalf, it wouldn't happen. Some more of the feel-good stuff, independent flight safety and accident investigation. So the largest and most advanced uh, accident investigation units in the world are actually driven from pilot associations. So the FAA has theirs. Transport Canada has some, There's, each government has one, but the large ones that come back with the most responses that's fed back to the uh, airline manufacturers and the industry in general come from independent pilot associations. Protection during merger and acquisition. Uh, this one comes up all the time. So what, what would happen if, if we were to buy another airline? It's important to understand is that the labor code and the history of the, of the um, industry in general is made up of mergers and buyouts. Air Canada, if you were to look back in its present form and you take in the old Canadian Time Air, PWA, and the regional affiliates, affiliates is actually made up of 26 different airlines. So there's a history there. The rules that go whenever something, when an airline is merged is that no one suffers a hardship loss and no one um, in, uh, gets a windfall gain. So when they're looking into uh, buying, say, a regional airline, at a case in our point, is that the first step that happens is they come together and they have to deem a unit fit for representation. So that unit fit for representation would, um, if one of the um, units is already certified, then they have access to the board for, for uh, powers. If you're not certified, you have no access to the board to help you in that decision. So the, the one that came in with the previously certified agreement 
their contract remains, and the one that's not certified it means nothing. It's up to the discretion. So usually what would happen is that you would have to certify instantly to deem your unit fit for representation. Looking at the work and stuff that goes into this, I would challenge someone to do that over a day or two. Uh, the other aspect of that protection uh, during the merger acquisition is that are you, if you're already certified, and I alluded to it earlier, is that you maintain your current work rules until you deem that new unit uh, as fit for representation. So if you take uh, any merger that you can think of in the past, as long as they were certified, they came in. It was just business as usual. They got their same paycheck, same benefits, until they got together and ratified a new collective agreement between the two parties. Independent legal counsel. We go through this all the time, the question about, well, we have independent legal counsel. For the most part, we have access to independent legal counsel as far as insurance is covered, so we don't endure individual liability uh, if we roll one off the, off the edge of the runway or something. Where our independent legal counsel ends is the minute that you're terminated from the company. Where that sits right now is that if, you, if uh, you're terminated from the company, it all ends and you're on your own for anything. So that doesn't matter if the WJPA, current WJPA, thought it wasn't fair or, or thought that they shouldn't be terminated. Their um, legal protection ends. Under a certified agreement, it doesn't mean that we have to absorb the cost. If a guy clearly made, uh, acted egregiously and, and with total disregard for the law, we don't have to protect them under that duty of fair representation. But as an executive, we have to ensure that the process is followed up to them being on their own. If it's not, then we're not satisfying our duty of fair representation. But it doesn't mean that we have to subject ourselves to liability as an association to protect them indefinitely. You know? But there is that second step in there to make sure that if the executive believes or the membership believes that that person should get a fair trial, then we have the access to make it happen. And that person's not out on their own. Now this one is going to raise some eyebrows, but I'll, I'll tell you a story. So we want to reduce the threat of franchise unions. And I'll just a quick background is uh, there's a few of us that were there actually. Um, hired at uh, Air Nova in, uh, I guess, early two, in 2000. Uh, back when it was Air Nova, before it became Jazz. It became Jazz, 9-11 happened, uh, CCAA, bankruptcy language. Uh, as usual, the pilots were the first to step up. We got our... our uh, Collective agreements ratified for the you know 10% pay cut across the board. We're all ready to go, and so had everyone else at Jazz at that time, except the Teamsters. Teamsters were our flight attendants were represented. I think there was 1,800 of them at the time, represented by the Teamsters union. Uh, their concessions were pretty much in line with the rest of the company. What they have done, although the pilots did take a disproportionately large amount, which is what we do, right? Because <laughs> we have the most to lose. Uh, but there was some brinksmanship going on with the Teamsters. And as you dig into what happened, it came to within a day of a, of a, a lockout. And it was not to represent those 1,800 flight attendants at Jazz. It was because there was some other brinksmanship going on with 35,000 auto workers in southern Ontario at the time. So that's my issue. And that's one of the reasons why, quite honestly, I was a little bit turned off by the, by the franchise union idea. This is a case where just like a corporation can, uh, can uh, be uh, one of the proponents in not having a balanced scale, this is when a franchise union representing people from all aspects, the scale can not be balanced as well. So as pilots, what we're asking here, and, and you have to reach with me here a little bit, is that we need to take the lead on this. You know, if we can show it can be done in-house and take care of our own professional interests under the Canadian law to do it in-house, then when these perpetual drives, and they will be perpetual drives from outsized franchise unions, especially to certain members of our group, to our employee group, are happening, we can act as a resource in very short order to say, listen, we support you. We, we think that you should have access to third party dispute resolution as well, but why don't we keep it in house? You know? And that's, every pilot has an interest in that. That's, that's career, long-term career objectives. You know? So the guys that are running the show right now, and they're the right guys to do it, but they're not going to be here for the long term. We are, and we have a very vested interest in making sure that this happens. Retirement health benefits. It's a big one, and this is something that will not happen under the current system, because once your employment with the corporation ends, it ends. You know, And the reason that other companies have pensions and stuff is because that's a way to legally shuffle that off to an outside agency 
where they're taken care of. But where we can do it, have enduring memberships and associations. So you could be an associate member of the WPPA as a retired person. And we can set up using those same funds, if it's approved, if it's what the membership wants, to establish some sort of retirement health benefit. You know, and it means that you know, it's a camaraderie thing for me too. It's about, you know, uh, you'll hear stories from guys that are retired and it's like, you're done. Next day you're gone, you're out the door. You know, and you look at guys that have spent the last 15 years giving heart and soul to a company and, and coming to work and working with the same guys and looking forward to seeing their faces and then boom, they're out, right? So it's, this is one of those feel good things that an independent association can, that can provide. Charities. If, you know, like I said, WestJet has their own, they have charities and stuff, and, and if we're happy contributing to those, that's fine. But if we do have charities that we see as a professional pot association that we want to get involved with, then we can. You know, and then it's up to us and it's our money. So it's that 1% going to charities, right? Scholarships for our children. Like I said, these happen at all. Uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different associations. doesn't matter where you come. But if we want to decide as a membership that we want to set up scholarships for our children, we can. And the cool thing about it is it's, you can say it's a loophole, but 1% coming off our checks, going to that, and then going back to our kids. It's the way it works. We still get a tax deduction there, right? And at the end of the day, it's whatever the membership deems important. So if uh, um, any initiative that comes to the membership comes up through the executive, goes out, build a committee, and put it in there. And that's the advantage of having this. And we don't have to go ask the company for money each time we want to do this. The pilot agreement, is a, I hope that you're understanding this, is just a small part of what we're working towards here. So it, this isn't an issue that, that I would expect to just crop up every five years when it's in a pilot agreement time. There, a fully independent pot association offers so much more on the day-to-day -day basis. But on the pilot agreement side is that through our constitution, when we do have to go through the nasty business of deciding what our work rules are going to be for the next X amount of years, is that there's language in there that the negotiating committee will act under advisement of a professional negotiator. And that's something that we won't have access to here at WestJet, so in its current form. And for me, one of the biggest things, and you guys will see it, uh, you've seen it in this room, you've seen it as this thing is going through, is pilot engagement. It's an opportunity to, uh, to increase the amount of people working in the day-to-day, -day. and that's what a good pot association is. It's, it shouldn't be a few guys never flying and working all the time. It should be a whole bunch of guys flying still quite a bit and working a little bit, you know, because that's about getting out there and taking care of each other. And a lot, of, a lot of us were brought to WestJet, and we were here early enough that we all got to belong to something a little bit bigger than ourselves. And that's one thing I see that's not happening as much anymore. And it's not, a, it's not a fault of WestJet, it's just the growth of a corporation, right? Uh, where we might be able to go into Tim Morgan's office before or, or, uh, or uh, Don Bell and say, you know what, we should talk about this, or what do you think about this? Well, now we have a whole level of management in there that that's their job, you know? And so the reception's not always too warm. If you have an idea of how you, wanna, how you think that something could be changed, it's not because you're actually touching someone. And, and that's fine, that's, that's just the way that business works. But where we do have a lot of work to do and where we can really engage a whole bunch of pilots is by taking the initiative and taking true responsibility for our representation. Summary, just a quick one, and then I'll uh, get Seabass up here to chat at you guys for, uh, for a quick moment. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, what this comes down to is money. And it's not, you know, it's not uh, um, a tremendous amount when you look at it, but it is about us taking responsibility for, for our uh, own representation. To do that, we need financial independence. We, we can't have to go to the company each time and, uh, and ask for money to, in, in order to do things. And things will continually be pushed down the totem pole in their order of importance. Even though they're important to us as pilots or as a pot association, they're not as important to the corporation. And that's because the corporation has to recognize a return on investment. You know, it's hard to quantify if, if as a pot association that we want to do a cosmic radiation study, it's, hard to make a business case for that, to take it to flight ops, get them to buy in, into it because you can't quantify that cost or if there's an actual return on investment, right? But there's a return on investment for us as pilots. Of course there is, right? An example of that would be uh, 17 years for loss of license, right? It's been spoken of since the first guys got in the door and um, there's hintings of what it's going to look like, but I will tell you before you see it, it's going to be very, very expensive. 
and it won't be true loss of license because these traditionally belong under our own association. We have to fund that for the most part, right? And like I said, there's a, there's a deduction that takes place. The government has set up the mechanism for that to happen for us. Tax deduction pact. So I've spoken about it for so that 1% dues, tax deductible. It's put in that reason because the government, through the labor code, has determined that this is the way that they will accept employees represent, rep representing themselves within industry and for industry to represent themselves to pilots. To incent that, they've made those dues that you pay a tax deduction. I will tell you right now on the record, PAC dues will never ever be tax deductible. If they can say they can send it off to a tax lawyer, I've got the case law, they will never be tax deductible because PAC will not, is not considered at arm's length and it will not be legally certified under the labor code as representation. The pilots cannot expect a corporation whose primary mandate is cost control to take care of our long-term career interests or our profession. <clears throat> That's the job of a professional pilot association. Well, no means Rob or Rob McFadden. I grew up about three hours east of here on a small farm. So when I first heard about the WPPA or unionization, it's not something that was necessarily in my repertoire. Um, if somebody had asked me a few months ago if I would endorse a uh, certified body or unionization, I would have said you're off your rocker. The reason that I've got here today, and I'll sort of walk you through the thought process for me, was I was elected into the WJPA uh, two summers ago and resigned just prior to the release of version one of the uh, tentative agreement. And I saw some processes in there that concern me as far as being a representative. Um, I thought actually even when I left that a good way to go is I was going to save the whales. I was going to try to find a bunch of like-minded individuals that we could run into the WJPA under a mandate and try to affect some change. In that process and that thought process that I had there, the WPPA members approached me and asked me if uh, I'd be willing to meet with them. So I said okay. Um, I didn't really expect to uh, come to any sort of a decision at that point in time that certification was the place to go. But I met with them. They discussed some of the concepts that I'd put forward as far as maybe making some changes to the WJPA. And I figured it was my responsibility to really look at what a certified body is. Where I come from, certified bodies are controversial, or they're adversarial. Um, you know, in my mind, in the philosophy that I was, had always grown up with, um, you know, they could potentially destroy uh, an institution or a corporation because, you know, what I used to see and what I used to hear was stuff you'd see in the news. And that's usually when the big conflicts come out. And that's the stuff you see. And, and people around us, I came from a, a small area where business was forefront every day in our dealings with other people. So I met with the WPPA. And I really had to get past those personal perceptions. So the first place I went after I, I talked to them is I started looking at the labor code here. And what I found after I looked at the labor code, well, there's there a lot of really good pieces in there. And the labor code isn't designed strictly on how we would interact with corporations on that process. There's some of that in there. But there's a lot of protections in there for our membership from their executive body as well. So it's a really good, I wouldn't say it's a really good read, it'll probably put you to sleep, but there are some very good points in there that you know, I really started to understand and it started to make me think that maybe this isn't a bad way for our pilot group to go. Um, WPPA Constitution was part of that and I looked at the Constitution and reflected a lot of the values that I believe that our pilots have here as far as being representative um, being forced to be accountable to your membership. I think the fact that I know that the labor code binds me by law to be diligent in representing you, I think that puts a lot of onus on your representatives. I think that makes them more accountable. I think we've seen some instances lately where maybe some of that accountability, and I think that is because of the system, has maybe been lost. When I looked at 
the code and the WPPA constitution and really started to grasp what certification was about, I thought it would be a good time to really weigh, should I try to fix the WJPA, you know, with the WJPA pilots, or should we pursue this model, the certified body model? And once you get past the stereotypes and what it really is, there really wasn't much of a question in my mind. We can affect some change, I believe, with the WGPA, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we'll never have an institution, you know, that can support ourselves as professionals and support each other as individuals within a group, as well as we could underneath of a certified body. So at this point, my spiel is relatively quick. I think we should probably open up to the floor because I'm sure we have lots of good questions out there, uh, lots of concerns, and really, start to have the discussion. These ones come up in, uh, so we, uh, as some of you are probably aware, we've, over the last uh, month or two, we've been having coffee at uh, people's houses, coffee shops. Uh, we get a few people out at a time. We get to talk about this, and these are some of the questions that come up. Uh, first one is, what about the relationship? And, and uh, I hear that one all the time, and I, I, uh, it's, it's, it's an important one for, for, for sure, and I, I often wonder, well, what is that relationship exactly, and how, and how could it change, you know? Uh, is the company all going to sudden close the door and not collaborate with us, or we're not going to collaborate with them to do what's right and what's smart for the business? Of course not. It doesn't make business sense to do so. And when you look at the history of this pilot group and the level of commitment and how much skin in the game that we have, to say that that relationship would change just because we want to legally certify our pilot association and our representation is a little bit disingenuous, I have to say. So, anything to add on that, Rob? Or? So here's the way I see the relationship going, is uh, just because we, we legitimize ourselves underneath the code, it does not make good business sense for whoever the CEO of the day is, or the administration in the office, to become confrontational with any of its labor groups. Um, as far as the pilots go, we, we know we're productive. We had a Seabury study. Um, we know we have a very engaged pilot group and uh, overall a, a relatively happy pilot group. So as far as the relationship goes, I think the best thing that most people would see happening here, and I think this would probably be the, the logical assumption, is that Greg Soretsky is going to accept us as the same group we are under a different governing body. And we would extend um, you know, our cooperative efforts towards the corporation because we really want to work with them. As Ian said earlier, no other employee group either here, uh, maybe the AMEs, has as vested an interest in the corporation's success as the pilots themselves. So logically, and that's how I made most of my determination about moving towards certification, it seemed like the relationship might actually be stronger because when we go in there, I'm bound to represent you. I have to represent your interests. That doesn't mean they're going to be the same as the corporation all the time, but they are going to know exactly what the employee group, the pilot group, feels. So when we go into the table and we express this is, this is what the pilots feel they need, this is what they desire, I'm not going to be influenced to change that. And right now you find a little bit of a, it's a, it's a difficult environment to live in because as a packed rep, you're somewhat bound to also represent the corporation. I know what the pilots want. I always did. WJP always knew what the pilots wanted as far as this last negotiation goes. And when we came out and fully endorsed it, it wasn't because they didn't know what you want. It was because they were basically stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I think here, if we ever end up in that process with our management, and it will happen, you'll end up at an impasse occasionally to ultimately a negotiated assembly is better. By having a certified body and having the conflict resolution mechanisms, it allows us to continue with the business. It allows us to keep moving forward. Uh, if we end up at an impasse, we move it off through the process as defined by the labor code uh, and our constitution to some extent. And we move to a referee, we move to a mediator or conciliator, uh, potentially maybe even arbitrator. But at least we don't end up in this quagmire of the unknown right now. We don't really know where we're going. So I really believe that by having that there and having a clear defined process, I think a relationship could actually be strengthened with management. It's, it's up to all of us to maintain that relationship and because I'm bound to you by the Constitution. Why couldn't you make this change from within? Well, uh, as one of the people that's tried to from within and a couple other of us that have tried, uh, you know, um, I, 
I guess it was back in 2007, 2008, uh, as a step to try to prevent this going down the road is uh, I worked diligently on bringing in what the WJPA Policy and Procedures Manual is. It's basically a constitution to a certain point. Uh, about a week later, that, that entire policy procedures manual, even though it was ratified by the membership, by the pilots, and, and an independent vote was overridden by the PAC constitution. And that's why there's this question about when elections are supposed to take place and all that. So um, it can be taking place, but the fact is, is that it can't be done without our own individual funds. And to go through the steps of granting agency of authority, it requires us to have a membership drive. And the WJPA, as they are, will not get permission to have a membership drive. And that's as simple as it is. So there's going to be accusations that you'll hear about that we didn't approach, we didn't try to work within the system. There's a history that we worked within the system. Uh, our views were very well known before the WJPA was even made public that we um, desired a certified model, many of us. There's, I've been to town halls personally where people have stood up and said, we need to certify. The fact is, is that it's never been presented because it's not at the will of the company. So it will happen. And that's the reason that we can't do it from within. This isn't an us against them thing. This is what we believe, a group of us have got together and believe is our solution to this. Now, as we go forward, we've met with the WJPA very recently. We tried to see if we could find some common ground there. Uh, they're establishing a committee now to see if they can find, but I can guarantee you that Rob or I probably won't be on the committee, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> you know, and just to add to that a little bit, uh, when you talk about the changes within, so we could make a change to the policy procedures manual, uh, ultimately to affect the actual PAC constitution, very challenging because that PAC constitution governs the whole employee group here, so to, to make it representative of what we need and to make it robust enough to support our pilots for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years or for as long as your career is going to be here. Um, one thing about the institution we have right now is that our constitution is really the ultimate authority there would be Antonio, I suppose, at the end of the day or PAC. So by having our constitution open to interpretation by the person of the day, it really can sort of get you to the point where it might start to undermine the institution, depending on whether it's working for you or against you. So I think at the end of the day, having a constitution that's bound by law, and ultimately it's a contract. I mean, you are bound contractually as an executive to your membership, and you can call us to account. So I, like I said, I think that really puts a lot more accountability on your representative body and makes them, at the end of the day, better able to represent your needs. Are the membership cards secure? Get asked that one all the time. Uh, absolutely, as secure as they can get. Now, I would argue almost a little too secure. So they go directly to the mailbox or if you sign them with one of our committee or executive members, it goes from that, to the, directly to a safety deposit box where they sit. Which leads me to the next question is, how many cards do we have? Well, quite honestly, if uh, they're that secure that we don't actually know the exact number at any given time. There's two people three people that know the exact number at any given time. Uh, they've been sworn to uh, secrecy because the fact of the matter is, is that until we can have enough of these conversations and get the message out there and get a belief that it's the general will of the pilots to go down this road, we don't care. Now that being said, if you support this, then you do need to get your card in there because when we do, if we decide that we, we think that we've got enough of membership, that we go and count those cards and you did believe in it, but you didn't send yours in, then that might be it. And we just fold up shop and walk away, right? So if you believe in it, then you do need to get your card in. Um, if we go down this road, can we ever go back? That's one of the threats that we hear from the corporation all the time, and it's an absolute falsehood. If the same language, it's section 38 of the labor code, it's almost the same language that applying for certification and if receiving it, we can have uh, certification revoked. It says that any member of an employee association representing a majority can um, out apply for revocation of the uh, certificate. So you can go back if you want. Does it happen? Hardly ever. I wonder why, right? But it can happen. Are we allowed to talk about certification at work? Section 95 of the uh, Canadian Labor Code uh, prohibits members acting on behalf of the association, of the union. So that would be, for our case, executive and committee members. Where it prohibits us from persuading 
uh, employees while at work in the course of our duties from joining a union. However, it does not say that any pilot at WestJet cannot talk about certification or unions, the WPPA or the WJPA, because there's no WestJet policy that says thou shall not talk about unions at work. And it would actually be pretty illegal to put that in there. It's a freedom of speech issue, right? So when it's safe to do so, by all means, you can talk about the WPPA, you can talk about the WJPA, you can talk about NASCAR, whatever you want, right? Hmm. Well, exactly, and that's, that falls under the WestJet policy of respected work, so you can't bully someone or, you know, and that's the same way if you're, as a, as a pilot, if you feel someone's bullying you to being anti-union or anti-certification, that, that violates that respect in the workplace code too, which is a WestJet policy, right? Uh, how long is this all going to take? This is the last of the FAQs, and then we'll open up the floor unless Rob has anything to add. I can't tell you. Like I said, this is a, this is a Hearts and Minds campaign. Uh, we got together. We volunteered our time. You know, if, if to say it's for big raises and stuff is a fallacy, because quite honestly, if you, we could have worked one shift of overtime and made up for any raise that we'd probably <laughs> garner out of this. So this is about us taking care of, of the collective interests of our pilots and therefore taking care of the company. Like I said, no one's out here to destroy anything, and uh, as you get to meet each of the individuals, you'll realize that uh, it's quite the opposite. They're here to take care of each other. Yeah, well, as it sits right now, I, and this is just a personal view, I can't speak, but uh, I, I don't think there's an appetite for seniority scheduling here at WestJet. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I have a little side story, if you're interested about that, is that <clears throat> when a few of us, uh, after the, the merger of the multiple regional airlines, ended up in uh, Quebec, uh, we were going there as first officers, senior first officers because of the merger, but, <laughs> but uh, we, we went to uh, Quebec and what had happened about 15 years before that is that within three months, the entire captain list had been hired. So one, captains one to 55, I remember their name, Bernard Simone and Eric Perron, had been hired. Fast forward 15 years later, number one gets everything he wants, but like I said, that, the seniority scheduling thing, it's not equated with, with being in a union at all. It's, uh, seniority scheduling is actually more of a uniquely North American thing and through a lot of the world it doesn't necessarily happen that way. There's varying levels of seniority that happen but like I said it would have to be driven from the membership. It's not a decision that the executive makes and presents. It's uh, the will of the pilots. Uh, under the labor code when you apply for certification all the cards have to have been signed within the last six months. We're not uh, we're not close to that yet but I, and I, I imagine it will happen when we get close is that we'll probably be sending out uh, information via the website or whatever that says if you haven't sent your card in six months please send it in again with and we'll ask for another five dollars that's a legal thing anyway so uh, what happens when you uh, certify is what's called a statutory freeze is put in place until the collective agreement is ratified so current working conditions benefits uh, health benefits are frozen in place. It's, it's actually labeled the statutory freeze. But at that point, and that's true, everything is up for negotiation. You know, if the membership determines that they like the ESP program the way it is, then by all means, we'll do it. The company has a say in this, and it's a back and forth, obviously, but it all comes down to a total cost at the end of the day. So if we want to put our bargaining collateral on preserving the ESP, then by all means, I, I'm confident that it would stay. There's, it's not a... It's, it's a, um, a threat that's, that can't be actually taken is saying that we certify, oh, they're taking the ESP, they're taking the profit share. It's not. It operates under a statutory freeze, and then it becomes part of our collective agreement, and we negotiate it. Yeah, right now, as, as uh, it sits, and it's outlined in our Constitution, is that uh, all pilots up to S2, so standards one, standards two pilots, that's uh, for a majority, that's guys doing uh, charts and extra duties in the office belong as they do currently to the WJPA would belong to the WPPA. Once you accept a position above that, like chief pilot, that's an S3 position. So they are, they belong to the management side of things then. So they don't belong under our constitution, but the relationship doesn't need to change at all by any means. It's just a difference of the, of the way things are set there. It's, we've kind of mimicked a lot of this through our WJPA. The only problem is that it's not an independent association. Right. So it's, there's nothing to say that it wouldn't remain exactly the same. Well, you know, like I said, this is the, this is the place to do it. You know, these meetings, these, uh, and if you're interested in, in helping out in a further, we can talk about that later for sure. We're, we're, we've got lots of room and lots of places. So like I said, it's about the engagement in it. Uh, when I look at the end of the day, uh, you know, most of us in this room have had a really good ride here, you know, and it's good. Life is good. We could, 
protect ourselves with indifference and turn on the apathy light and just <clears throat> trudge through the next 25 years if we want. If we didn't have any regard for our, the guys coming in the door now or our counterparts or anyone that's actually had to go through some condition where it's been a challenge about how they were represented. Uh, this is about creating a trusted place where our fellow pilots can come to us and we have a mechanism to make sure that they're represented to the company through the labor code. And that's what it's about. You know, I, I worked at an airline where we went through multiple mergers and a bankruptcy and I have honestly not seen the level of fear and mistrust that I see here sometimes. And that's not how we were built. That's not how this place started. Sure as hell not why I came here, right? So that's part, but the reason is we need to take care of that ourselves now. We can't, we can't expect our managers to do all that for us. I mean, we've, we've been pretty lucky so far. They've done it, you know, and they, they try to do a job. But at the end of the day, the business has to take the priority and we can't expect them to be taking care of the minutia details of taking care of ourselves as pilots, right? <laughs> That's yeah. a great. Yeah. Well, Literally, I have yeah. a little brother flying a dash over there. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've outed him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I see Encore pilots as Westship pilots flying Dash 8s. And if we can get our own house in order and ultimately represent them, that would be the best for everybody at WestJet. Uh, right now, I know the theme of the day from the WGPA is they've just put two or three people, I think, into the WGPA from Encore. And they expect them to negotiate an agreement, which I think anybody that uh, really looks at it, these guys are all on probation, and you look where we ended up here just, just recently, I think they'd be a lot better served by having us together as a, as a whole and supporting each other. I don't care what you fly. I don't care if you fly a Dash 8, I don't care if you fly a 777 or a 737. At the end of the day, if we can come together as a group and support each other, that ultimately will make this a, a better place for everybody to work. So I think we should be you know, pursuing um, representation of the Encore pilots as well. Um, yeah, to the Encore point, at the moment we can represent Encore pilots. Encore pilots can send applications in. Um, our constitution can be uh, utilized by their group right now as well. And in fact, if they got a, uh, a majority, a 50 plus one of their group or, uh, to have their cards in right now, we could, uh, they would, uh, could apply for certification even before us. So um, this whole system, I think, is that's one of our goals, I think, I'd agree in this whole thing, is to actually unify the two groups. Um, and then that avoids that whole typical divide and conquer situation that you get in most airlines. We can offer the Encore pilots a lot here, actually. And I think that we all have a, a common interest in doing so. And this is the time to do it before there's a lot of people off the street hired in between. Uh, us and them, which was one of the big classical problems, I think, if any of us that have come out of that Air Canada world. Um, there's options for us that I've, I've looked at legally as well. Um, if they certify and we certify, we can bring them together. 35% is... Or 50% and then it's automatic, right? Yeah, there's, there's basically three levels that come into play under the code. There's the 35%. 35% is the point at which, 35% plus one, technically, um, you can go to the Labour Board and CIRB and ask them to hold a vote. Now, they don't hold it through the company email system like most of our votes are done or through key surveys. It's done, actually, typically, at the, they will find out where the employees are in this case. And when they've done these for airlines before, they do them at the hotels, typically, um, that the crews are at or at the airports themselves. And, and you vote. And, it's, and there'll be like a time frame anything typically, I think 10 days to two or to 15 days or something that they give that the employees are offered to vote. In that case, if, it's a, if you have a vote, it's the majority of those who vote that determines whether the certification occurs, right? Uh, the alternative method is to not have a vote and to just simply go uh, to get to the 50 plus one. If you do not have an existing union, uh, certified union in place, uh, then at 50 plus one, you can apply for the certification. That's a decision to be made by the executive of this group, right? And that would be on a, a circumstantial basis, I think. Um, I can, I think if there was a merger all of a sudden, you might want to pull that trigger yeah. as soon as you could because you need to have yeah. that access to the board as quickly as you could. Well, I think an important thing that is it is not our goal and we do not want to, uh, to, uh, um, fragment this pilot group in any way. In fact, a, frag I have a, mic on it. Oh, a, a fragmented pilot group could very easily be uh, turned over on itself. So, like I said, uh, the, cords, the cards are important from the legal aspect to get the certification done, but until we have a, a good, strong 
uh, knowing will from the pilot group, it would be an exercise in futility, quite honestly. So to me, going at 35%, unless it was deemed that, that the process has been inhibited and we're not getting out there and there's a bunch of people that want to vote yes, but they can't because they're not, they don't have access to a secure voting system or whatever, is that this is more of a hearts and minds and we need to get this message out, you know? So it's not a matter of forcing our way in. This isn't a guerrilla attack from within. If there was a way that this same process and the access to a certified pilot group could have been done within the system, we would absolutely have done it, but it can't. Well, uh, because we've uh, engaged in a uh, certification drive is that we have rights that have never been granted to any employee under the CRB. For the first time ever in WestJet history is we actually can apply to the CRB for a ruling if we need to. So if, if there's, if we need clarification on, on uh, for instance, whether we should have access to the employees at any given time or we should have access for a meeting is that we can get the CRB to say whether we can or not. And it's not a, it's not a matter of us having to get lawyers and get into this big legal fight because the authority of the Industrial Relations Board is to act in this manner. So they can go in, they get the information, they make the ruling. Tr traditionally, the office days, so there's a, it's, it's uh, agreed to in, within the collective agreement. So what you agree to is a pool of office days or flight relief for certain members and stuff. I think most likely it's, it's a certain amount of office days and then a month or two in advance is members of the committees or the executive or whatever would allocate those out. You send that off to crew scheduling, they put them in your schedule as an office day and you get credit for that. So that's one thing that the company is allowed to give you time off from your present duties to conduct uh, union, but they can't directly give you money and resources. That's so, all. So typically salary could come, would come in, in normal associations. You guys would pay the salaries of those who you elect. So therefore, that's that accountability stream. Now, yeah. again, the, the accommodation that the employer can provide yeah. is dependent. Typically, a lot of people that do the kind of committee stuff, if it's a committee that's especially that's something of mutual benefit to the company, usually that's time that the company gives for them to yeah. do that kind of work. Typically, though, your top leadership, um, executive level leadership, president, vice president, those kind of people that are full-time engaged in it, they're usually on, on a secondment or a leave. And then the, the dues that are coming in are what are paying their uh, flight relief pay. Fully it, transparent. It, it yes. will all be 100% transparent, and that's a right that you have under law yeah. mm -hmm. with our system that we'd have to provide any of that kind of data to any member. An interesting side note here, since we're talking finances a little bit, is let's say the WJPA wanted to roughly emulate this and charge. The reason it's 1% roughly is, you know, it's somewhat emulated after Southwest. That's what they charge their membership right now. So under the WJPA, if we had done it this way, um, we couldn't have certified, but if we wanted to try and bring some of the funding in-house, well, you would be paying pure cash for that. Uh, so that 1% is going to come right off your check, and there's no rebate from the, from the government as far as that goes. So just financially alone, if we want to bring our own finances in-house, the certification argument is pretty much, for me, sewn up right there. It's a 40% tax... 40% value add from the government to mm. our bottom line as a certified association. There, Something that happens right now is that money's gone, it goes as a flight ops budget, comes out of our profit sharing. This alone is a 40% tax rebate. Well, through the, through the uh, revocation language there, like they're revoking the certificate language, if, if, we, they, if we can get them to come to us, what we can provide is a bridge, a little bit of interim resource so that they can do that. If that's the will, and I, like, like I said, as a, as an owner of the company, I have a vested interest in that, you know? So we could act as that resource to say, okay, this is what you guys did, you know, and this is, the, they, I know they promised you the moon and you're probably not getting it, you know? But let's, let's bring this back to WestJet, let's bring this back into the company, we could help them, you know? And that's, that's, like I said, that's one of the things that, Encore, these are the things that keep me doing this, you know, is, uh, is that I'd like to protect us from that. And if we could so. pre be preemptive in that, yeah. that would ultimately be the best way to do yes. it. Yes. If we certify, I mean, we're going to be busy. Uh, this, this is going to be a lot of work for a lot of years. But we could extend the expertise within the group to them and show them how to do this themselves versus going outside, which would probably ultimately work better for them and as us as owners would work better for, for everyone. That's a relationship builder for us too with the current management or whoever the management of the day is too, right? It, it, uh, and I'll tell you, it can't under its, it would still require the same thing that we're doing right now. It's to require a membership drive.
to grant agency of authority and then it would have to be deemed fit for representation. And to be fit for representation, it, has to, it cannot have undue employer interference. So as it sits right now without its own funds and that having their own funds means they have to collect money. So I, I, it'll be interesting to see if there would be an appetite from any employee group at WestJet to take the, the amount of money required off their paychecks to sustain it and not have it be tax deductible. In my opinion, and for the most of us in the committee and executive levels, is that we've got as far as we're going to get under the current structure. So. Yeah, I mean, we've uh, most of us have been in there. You know, yeah. we've seen it. We've seen the uh, the good and the bad. Um, just one little story, and it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I was in. Uh, I was pretty new, and they send the initial PAC representatives or WJ predators representatives to training. And I remember it was somewhat enlightening for me. We were in a, a course. And the first, one of the first things that came up after we'd, we'd done the um, initial presentation was what happens in a disciplinary hearing in PACT. And a girl asked, I said, well, I'm there to represent the person, you know, and, and, try, to, and try to help them out. And she was like, ooh, no, 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 no. You must be one of those union guys. And I was like, no. <laughs> that was my job. I'm here to represent the, the individual and, and help them out. And it was explicitly stated to me, and we had lots of training, that my job was to go and watch, but the individual was, was ultimately responsible for representing themselves. I was just there to see that the, the process had gone as per mandated by the PAC Constitution. And that was a real eye-opener for me. Um, because I really believe that it's, we're all human, we make mistakes, and I think it's always good to have somebody on your side, you know, in those kind of situations. So that was just a little bit of an aside. You know, because the company certainly does. If anyone that's been involved in some kind of incident or accident mm -hmm. is, uh, is that the company's side is well represented, you know, and that's the mm -hmm. reason for that balance, you know. I'm the one here who's been on the actual pact uh, executive as well, or G7 as it was called, and I can make it, from experience, make it very clear <laughs> that the first thing that was, was stated to me, <laughs> back, and that's even back in 2006, and it's certainly still true now, is it is pretty clear when you're at that executive level that the interests of the company are first, the interests of all the employees are second, the interests of your subgroup are third. And make no mistake, there needs to be a clear understanding here that the WJPA is only a subcommittee of PACT. That's been a bit of a misrepresentation, in my opinion, um, over the last several years here, that, there's, that, there's a par that we're parallel to them, or that they're just the others, there's us and the others. It is a subordinate relationship. And when you're in there, you, in the case of when I was, it was seven members and it's six now in the executive, you, all decisions made for subgroups with respect to anything that they cannot resolve with, with management themselves go to votes where the other groups are deciding on what you get. We get uh, solicited from the media almost on a daily basis, definitely on a bi-daily <laughs> basis. Uh, so far at this point, um, uh, the CEO is the only one that's mentioned this to the media. I mean, he's done it, you know, and not the WPPA specifically, but he's mentioned that there's union movements going on and stuff. At this point, you know, and this is something that, that uh, this is why there's an interim executive is to decide if we need to engage the media at this time at all. You know, uh, from uh, there, pro there may be a point depending on what the company does, but we're, right now we see no advantage of us going to the media and crying about our complaints and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, it, it, only if we saw it as a way, one of the only ways that we could reach our own pilots. But from what I've seen in the past is our own pilots don't like opening up the Globe and Mail and seeing their story out there. So, like I said, is that, does that answer it? If, if, yeah, so the media, it's one of those things, if it takes an advantage, I, I know the corporation is very fond of going to the media and talking about all this stuff, and that's fine. That's within their prerogative to do it. I just don't know if there's, a, if there's an advantage to it, you know. Does that, anyone else want to add anything? Oh, to that? That's fair enough. Yeah, I think we try to keep our in-house work to ourselves. We're busy enough with the task at hand, <laughs> quite honestly, yeah. than to pandering to uh, media <laughs> outlets. Who, quite honestly, our own corporation gives a lot of advertising money too, right? So mm -hmm. to say that the the treatment might be balanced would would be a stretch. So mm -hmm. well, you know, and I'll tell you that. So the um, <coughs> we met, uh, Rob and I met with the WJPA. Uh, yesterday, after light, quite literally, and I can show you the email track, of uh, two months of trying to engage them, to, to get them to come to talk to us. And meanwhile, they've known who we are. Um, some of us have stood up in town hall meetings years ago saying, 
we need to have an independent certified body. So they've known that we've existed, we know that we believe this. So now they're gonna play that we're acting as this rogue body from, from outside, you know, and they know who we are. Our phone lines have been open the whole time. It took us a, a month and a half to get even a meeting with two of them to sit down and have a talk. And the fact is, is that arbitrarily from the, the day that we officially launched the certification drive is that all 26 members were kicked off the uh, WJP form. So they don't want to hear about certification. That's their mandate. No. It's, and they're not going to get permission from the corporation to certify. So they can say, well, I'm not opposed to it, but the fact is they won't get permission to do it. The only way that we could have started this was from here. And like I said, and I hope, I, I'm, I hope you didn't get, we're not trying to, to tell you what you want to hear. We're not going to say we're going to knock an agreement out of the park. We're just saying this is how we think we can take care of ourselves a little bit better. And by doing that, we'll take care of the business. That's yeah. it. So. And, and the reason we met with them is because, you know, no, I didn't have a high expectation that would necessarily they would be receptive to it. But if we could have ultimately worked collaboratively or collaboratively with them to bring the message out to the pilot group, uh, really it's just about allowing our pilots to make the decision. You know, we're not here to sell you on anything. We're here to tell you what it is. And you can make the decision on your own. But it would be good if we could go out as a group, as a, you know, a whole group of pilots and have this discussion, yeah. open and honest. Um, you know, it's, it's not a panacea, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of good involved with it. And I think it's, I think it's an important discussion for all of us to have so that we're, we're well informed when it's time to make that decision. And for the record, we invited at them to gather all the pilots in a room with their interests, our interests, and anyone else who wanted to mm -hmm. express a way to fix this. And there, it was met with, uh, yeah. yeah, there was no interest in it. Well, I don't want to speak for them. I can speculate on what their thoughts are right now. And, and after our meeting the other day, uh, certification for them is not something that they even want to remotely address. Uh, if they did, they would have come out with us and brought the message to the pilot group. So their interest at this point is um, trying to create some sort of a, a change with impact um, versus going to certification. And why they believe that, I, I think they ultimately are maybe just uneducated as to, far as to what this is. When I left uh, the WJPA, I really didn't, I wasn't very receptive to the, the concept myself. I had to really educate myself uh, because of my background, where I come from, and uh, you know, some of, the, some of the stuff I'd, I'd heard in there. And then you know, once you come out and you meet the guys, you know, I had a lot of respect for the individuals already involved with it, and you really start looking at it from a, a logic perspective, it was a no-brainer for me. So I, I think there's a lot of that, maybe just some ignorance they don't understand. Uh, probably a lot of pressure from the corporate body to not address this. Because if we went out with them right now and we discussed the benefits of whatever their vision is going to be in the future, I don't know what it's going to be, uh, versus this, logic pretty much dictates that you, I think, would gravitate towards the side because it's, there's a lot of benefits here versus what we can go there. It's like going a third of the way or going all the way. And um, I think by getting to this point, we're going to create a body that's, you know, I'm excited about what we can do with it. I think, uh, you know, with the collaboration of our pilot group and working together, we can make uh, something that's akin to what the Southwest, pilot ha or Southwest pilots have. And we welcome the hard questions by all means. That's, yeah. what we, that's what we want to get in the room. We want the the hardcore anti-union, this destroys business. We want those guys, we want those questions. We want to show, that's not, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not that company. We're not, just like WestJet isn't that corporation, you know, that does mm -hmm. that. In the same sense, how could you say that overnight with the flip of a switch that this pilot group would become that pilot group? Can I take the first part of it anyway? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, as the first part, I said you're only as good as, uh, as the solutions that you can come up with, right? And I think the, what, our constitution and what this provides, like I said, is a level of engagement that we don't have now and we won't have under the current system. So having a little bit of indemnity for the representatives from the corporation, something that we don't have now, but it allows the people that to step into that job and the level of engagement that will bring more creative and proper solutions to that. So I'm not saying it has to cost a cent more, but there, as I look through that agreement, one thing, uh, the agreement, and I'll say this too, is a symptom of a system that's broken, right? But the agreement lacked creativity because there's no onus to bargain in good faith there. There's no onus to come up with creative solutions there. Uh, once any negotiation becomes that unbalanced and that one-sided, the, the, what is arrived of at the middle is not going to be in the best interest of, of both parties. And, uh, you know, we, when I speak of that level of engagement, right now they can't, 
bribe six people, is it left, or five people, to go in there and do that job, you know? But for some reason, 26 people were willing to stick their necks out and truly volunteer their time and resources because we see a need for change. So I think that's the kind of, if that answers your question, it's that level of engagement and it's, the, it's actually the access and that overhanging access to mediation and arbitration. I'm not saying that we'll ever have to use it, but it puts the onus on both parties to bargain in good faith, right? It doesn't mean it has to be used, but it puts the onus on it. Oh, by absolutely. So within the Constitution, the access to, to work under the advisement of a, of a professional negotiator, which you won't have, and the resources to access that. If, as, as the uh, negotiating group, if you want access to independent third-party studies on our competitiveness within certain markets, it's there, it's done, and it's public knowledge because we own it, we paid for it, right? It's licensed to us. Uh, if we want access to any part of the market that's going to help reinforce our position and our competitiveness, as a case to why we, we, we uh, feel that we are pushing for a certain agenda, then we have access to it. As it sits now, we have to get permission from the company to bargain on our behalf, yeah. right? And I think for us, ultimately, I mean, Ian alluded to it earlier, the tentative agreement is a relatively small part of why this is being done. I mean, it's, uh, it's not about the get from the corporation. It's more about bringing ourselves together as a group and supporting ourselves professionally and personally. And once we start to represent ourselves, represent ourselves as professionals and business people, um, contracts in the future and working conditions will be a byproduct of us acting like those types of people. And by having access to a contract facilitator, I mean a professional negotiator. Right now, like the way I saw our negotiation go when we were in there is, uh, well, I didn't have any training because I came late to the game. Everybody else had one or two days. And I think that would be akin to throwing a private pilot in the front of one of our 37s and tell him to go into St. John's and shoot an approach to minimums of 30 knot crosswind. He probably isn't going to survive. If he does, it's not going to be pretty. And that's, you're up against the best of the best. I mean, the corporation did their job very adequately. And that's what their job is. Uh, ROI, make as much money as they can. They're not there to be benevolent. So the shortfall was really the lack of resources on our part, if you really want to come down to the tentative agreement. So we're stuck, in a, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, that's kind of the topic of the day. Maybe this is the topic of the day right now. But they come and go, ultimately, what we have to do is act like professionals, act like business people, and everything else will be a byproduct of that. That's where I really see it going. One of the biggest weaknesses we have with the WJPA right now, the way it's established, is we have no real dispute mechanism process. I either capitulate and say, I'm going to take it out, or I resign. That's really the two options that are available to me. And when I resigned, I didn't want to resign. I mean, when you're elected in by people to represent them, the last thing you want to do is uh, throw your hands up there and quit. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, I couldn't have had any more effect in there. It was done. The tentative agreement had been put out. And there's a lot of pressure in there after you're exposed to that. Who here went to a town hall with Greg Soretsky? Yeah. If I was Greg Soretsky, we would have been done half an hour ago and we'd all be drinking beers, he would have signed cards. But, you know, when you go to those town halls and you're exposed to it, yeah. <laughs> When you go to a town, when you, when you see the, the ability these people have to communicate and you're exposed to it every day, day in and day out, it's, it's difficult when you're, you're not operating at arm's length, and that's what we mean by at arm's length, to not eventually become a product of your environment. And I think that's what you really saw was a lot of people are blaming it on the people in the WJPA. None of those people went in there with the intention of going out and endorsing an agreement that quite frankly, it wasn't too hard to figure out it wasn't going to pass, especially version one. And if you throw more good people into that system, I think we're going to end up with the same result. So if we can bring other supports in, like a, a professional or a, a contract, I keep calling them contract administrators, professional negotiators, we bring those kind of people in to help us through the process. They'll be able to tell us when it's going right or when it's going wrong, because Greg Soretsky and his team, very good. They've been doing this for 30 years. And to think that us as a group of pilots, without some professional assistance, are going to give you the best product that we could probably achieve at the end of the day is a bit asinine in all reality. So that's kind of how I saw the, how you saw the agreement going down. There was a few requests from the pilot group. They wanted, the first officer wanted to extend their pay scale. He wanted the ESP in the contract. Um, there was the options. Nobody liked the options when they first did that sur survey a couple years ago. But ultimately, our pilot group indicated that you were all relatively happy with our, our contract. And Greg Soretsky could have rubber stamped that thing in 30 minutes, and we wouldn't even be here today. You know, I think if we'd probably 
stamp the current agreement we have with the uh, inflationary increase in there, we probably would have passed it 70% the first time out. I'm speculating on that. So for us to go in and negotiate with those guys, it's good to have the assistance, it's good to have the tools, and it's good for me to have to be bound to you by law to represent your interests because it keeps it very clear for me. I know where I have to sit, and when we do come to an impasse, if we come to an impasse, I mean, Southwest is probably the one of the most heavily unionized institutions and states as far as airline goes. And they have the lowest rate of labor strife. And they have the IAM in there. They have some of the most militant unions in the United States in there. So they've chosen to work with the corporation. The corporation has chosen to work with them. And they do it under the, the body or the certified body. And it works very well for them. So negotiation is a small part of it. I think it could be a lot better. Uh, but ultimately, we've got to look after ourselves first. We've got to get ourselves together and come together as a pilot group because that will make us much stronger at the end of the day than coming in and being segregated in our, our beliefs or opinions. I, I think as a stepping off point, it is. You know, and it, there's language within the Constitution for the executive to increase that, but it has to be approved by the majority of the membership. So it's a stepping off point. Like I said, uh, any time that something like this starts off, the first year is going to be pretty lean. You know, the first order of business will be to ratify a collective agreement so that we could legally um, deduct the dues. So it's going to be a little bit lean, but like I said, 1%, that's about building it up, and it's a stepping off point. 1% is what works for our, our role models, you know, a SWAPA or whatever. Yeah, ELPA at 1.95%, they're funding a little bit bigger of a corporation and bureaucracy, which they're sometimes mm -hmm. criticized for. So I think... Five of that is in the case of like ELPA or the affiliated unions, you're not getting... Your, your, your local, your group is only getting like to about 1.15 1, 1. or yeah. something percent in the case of ELPA, that like 0.85 roughly is going back to ALPA. So obviously you're, those units are actually operating on the 1%, but mind you, they do have a set of resources they can fall back on that are already in place. And what we do have in the interim is we have uh, other pilot associations that, that set money aside all the time to help us new guys out all the time, independent ones from all over the world that are willing to, to help us out. And they have a fund for that. It's what they do, right? They do it in the, in the interests of the profession in general. And they help the new guys starting out. And I, I would hope that one day, maybe maybe after my time here or whatever, but that our association would be in a spot to do that too, you know, because it's one of those things that's good for the profession. Uh, um, you know what? We're many of us have contacts uh, at Swap and stuff. You know, I, uh, Steve and I both spent some time on the on the circuit, I guess the the conference circuit over the years and stuff. So yeah, we have uh, we have contacts there. Uh, they've expressed an interest in uh, in giving us uh, <coughs> guidance and mentorship, by all means. So we, we do we do have a little bit of a past with Swap already, because many of you can remember we were going to enter into a code share relationship with them at an earlier time. So uh, we've had a few beers with those boys, and, and by all means, they're there. They're trying desperately to avoid certification. So certification is the tool, according to the law. It's it's how we actually rep do representation, right? So, but of course that's big and scary and means all kinds of adversarial moments and things like that. So they're trying to find some, grasping at any other type of kind of middle ground. There's two elements to representation, right? There's, there's that collective element that we all focus on all the time. But what about that, that you got called into the office because somebody said you did that or this or that, right? That's that individual representation that you need. And at the moment, I can tell you from being in that system, you have nothing. At the end of the day, all you have right now is this thing called a PAC guaranteed, uh, PAC to guaranteed fair treatment policy. And I've been up through disciplines, including discharges, uh, as representation within that system, and it's circular. It's the same person who's making the decision to discipline you or discharge you that you're appealing to at the end of the day. So again, this corporation idea would have absolutely no way of addressing any of our individual interests, rights, or protections. So You've got to ask why they're doing it. And the reason they're doing it is because they do not want to certify. There might not be any logic behind it. Uh, they might try to make it look legitimate, but really at the end of the day, and it's the same thing, same reason I came to the decision that I think certification is good, is we have this or we've got something that's already set up. I mean, it's set up in law. I mean, there's a constitution and all we have to do is sign the cards and go. So versus making something with an awful lot of unknowns, which could put us probably potentially in a worse situation than we're in right now. So it, it doesn't really make a lot, there's no logic behind it that I can see. Yes, we do. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that was the first step in setting all this up to make sure it's done correctly. We have one of the best firms. 
Okay, that, that's true. There's $250,000 that are, is set aside as long as you remain actively employed with the company and that the, the PACT representatives approve the release of that $250,000 on your behalf. So whatever mistake you may, have, may or may not have made as a pilot has to be passed by a flight attendant, a sales agent, and uh, a maintenance guy, and they get to judge whether or not that money's released to you. So, and it's only while you're gainfully employed. If WestJet determines that you made a mistake, an egregious mistake that's outside the scope of your employment at WestJet, and they terminate you, that stops. You're on your own.